the first episode of Building Enablement. This is a web series where we talk to enablement professionals and dive deep into the details on programs, trainings, events, whatever they want to talk about, um, basically what they did and how they did it. So I'm Stephanie Mitta. I am the uh, head of enablement at Divi, which is a financial technology company uh, startup out of the Utah area. And my guest today, I'm super excited, is John Zorich. Is that how you say your last name? It is. Yes, I score. Okay, good. How's it going? Good, good, good. Awesome. So I want to kind of introduce everybody, like tell us a little bit about yourself before we kind of dive into stuff. Yeah, yeah, you bet. And thank you for setting this up too. Really glad to be here today. Uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, just a little bit about me. I'm from Western New York, Buffalo, New York originally, but I've been uh, living in the Utah, I've been living in Utah for, gosh, uh, longer than I care to admit. Many <laughs> Uh, anyway, so my, my background uh, professionally has been in learning and development for my whole career, um, and with a special emphasis, I guess, in sales enablement, particularly for the last 11. Uh, most of that was with Adobe. I had about eight years with them, um, and now almost three years coming up on that mark with Qualtrics, a uh, startup out of Provo. So nice. Currently, I lead the global enablement solutions team. That's part of a, a broader global enablement team as well. And uh, yeah. Sweet. Well, I'm super excited to have you join. Um, you are like starting to kind of get up and running on LinkedIn, like sharing a lot of your insights, which I love. Like I love seeing that stuff on LinkedIn. So I'm excited to, to hear what we're going to talk about today, which what are we talking about today? <laughs> Great. Yeah. You know, I wish I had a, a very short, concise, simple name for this program. Um, but it, I thought it would be useful to share uh, some of the details about a program that I was leading in mostly in 2019. Um, I was, so I was with, I was leading a team then of uh, mostly sales trainers. And what we were trying to, to solve for was like, how do we get a greater number of reps who could reliably and predictably hit quota? Uh, I mean, that was like the, the big thing in there. And so we we had a strategy that we devised around that. I thought it'd be good just to dive in and share some of the details of how that worked. Sales reps hitting quota. I mean, who would guess that that's something that enablement would cover, right? No, no one, um, no one's struggling with this problem. Because <laughs> <laughs> everybody is hitting quota. It's totally fine. No worries. Everybody knows how to do it. Yeah, um, everyone's like, oh, geez, not this <laughs> Right. Another another quota program. Another quota thing. <laughs> yep. Well, I'm excited to hear about what you guys did there at Qualtrics, like how you kind of came up with it. Let's let's get into the weeds on this. Like, let's actually dive in and, and see. So I would love for you to kind of talk about like you kind of already glossed over it a little bit, but like aside from like quota, like what problem were you trying to solve? Like what kind of kicked off this initiative from the get go? Yeah, I think just to give a little bit more context and detail to that, you know, at, at Qualtrics, we've been in this hyper growth mode for years. I mean, what, long predating me. And, and we, but we knew we couldn't like sustain that indefinitely just by hiring more reps, right? Like we're, we're not going to be able to hire our way out of that. At some point, you've actually got to invest in your people and develop their skills more and get more out of them. You can't just throw more bodies at the situation. So uh, like we recognize that, and this program was really um, primarily targeting our corporate account executives in the Americas region, at least to start. And the idea was, okay, let's nail it there, really demonstrate the value, and then hopefully, you know, start, you know, spreading that out and scaling that up a bit. So what we we're really trying to solve for was like, could we come up with a set of leading indicator metrics? And the idea behind it is that these should be metrics that would reflect like a rep skill development so that as we're training them and working with them and coaching them and doing all of these things to support them, ideally that should show up in some leading indicator metrics, right? Um, and that this would reflect their skill levels then um, along various stages of the sales pipeline. So these would be like conversion metrics. So not really like the number of deals they're working or the number of leads they're generating, but rather more like, you know, how many are you converting to the next stage of the process, right? So like of all of the contacts that you're talking to, what percentage are you able to qualify? How many of those turn into an opportunity where they want to take the next step? Of all of those opportunities, what percentage are you, you know, actually closed and resulted in a win? And then, you know, what was the size of the deals? right, that, that we're closing. So 
Altogether, we found like there were six metrics we had identified in order to gauge that skill level. So we were, we were thinking of it not in terms of like, you know, volume or quantity being a good indicator of skill, right? Because you could, you could still get there if you just worked your tail off and had an enormous number of people you're talking to, but that doesn't mean you're actually any good. It was more about, okay, the predictability has got to come because no, you, you're actually pretty good at, at those conversions. Yeah, this this sounds like a holy grail kind of like this is what every sales <laughs> enablement job description says. This is what every sales leader wants to hear. Like, I think everyone's doing this in this space. I don't <laughs> know. This might end up being redundant, but um. this it, it sounds like you know because it's in startup kind of world. Like right now, we're trying to figure out like what are kind of those metrics, and then like you're kind of taking it to the next level and be like, okay, now we've got the metrics. Like, how does this actually translate into like? skills like actual sales skills that we can like train on or get better in like it takes it to like this whole other kind of level well that was the trick and i don't know that we really nailed it but i i think it took us to some really good places and where we're where we set some things up right so like you know the idea is to increase the percentage of reps who are hitting these targets right in, in each of those metrics and so the idea is that if they if, and it was, the intent was to be very methodical, right? So that if a rep mastered a certain specific set of skills, then that should be reflected in one or more of these metrics, right? Uh, they should be able to hit the targets for those metrics. And we wanted them to like master the one set of skills, get really solid on that, right? Um, hit that metric target and then, you know, build upon that to develop another set of skills that would hit the next metric and then so on over time. Right. So that we wouldn't have to keep like backfilling and going back to, oh, well, now this one's out of sync and we got to work with you on this thing again. Like really, really have, make sure that they are solid on, you know, a particular set, you know, set of skills relevant to, you know, the top of the funnel in the sales process, let's say. And then before they move on to mastering the next set in, let's say, the middle of the sales funnel, they, they you know, we've demonstrated they really nailed those things. Right. So that would indicate that they were, you know, developing the skills needed throughout the sales process and increase their chance to predictably hit quota. So it wasn't just about getting them to hit quota, but the value was really in the predictability of it to make it like forecastable. I'm not sure if that's a word, but let's make it a word. Let's let's a word, right? Take your invented words. Right here, right now, we're making right forecastable now. a word. <laughs> forecastable. <laughs> oh. What we, what we did is we hired a, a, I hired a team of sales trainers and their job was to work with our sales leaders and then to also work directly with reps as well, coaching them, conducting workshops, but, but really to, to build out the strategy for how they're going to close those skill, those skill gaps and then like to increase the percentage of reps who are hitting those numbers. So it wasn't so much about like bringing up the overall you know, win rate of the company, for example, but rather how do you increase the number of reps that were consistently hitting a certain win rate target. That's great. And I, I think so many enablement folks kind of struggle with this. It's, it's not, it's exactly what you're saying. It's not quite just like that baseline. It's, it's up leveling them and yeah. making sure that you kind of have this entire program in place that you can do that. So I assume this was probably a slam dunk with with the sales leaders. Like, I can't imagine any sales leader be like, "That sounds like crap. I don't want to do oh, it." <laughs> on the contrary, far from, <laughs> far from it. No, I, I mean, well, to be fair, like, we really never had to get like an executive to buy in on this because we already had that. Fortunately, um, so I mean, I wish I could be the one to take credit for coming up with all of this and this whole strategy. But, you know, honestly, I can't. At Qualtrics, it was the brainchild of Dan Watkins. And Dan was uh, vice president of sales at Qualtrics. He's now president of a company called Forethought uh, in the Bay Area. And, and Dan led the way uh, because he provided the vision and the funding in order to back it up. And, and that's really rare in my experience. I mean, usually one of the biggest challenges I've had in my career is great, I dream up this program and now I got to go get the executive sponsorship to back it up. And okay. One of my chance. leaders used to call it the executive roadshow. She would go on the uh, executive yeah. roadshow, right. just pitching the idea to everybody in the company. Yeah. I mean, I really lucked out, I feel, because when I arrived at Qualtrics, Dan already had the vision for this and like for the program and what he wanted to get out of it. 
like we didn't have a strategy baked out. That's where me and my team came in, but he knew what he was trying to do. That general idea of, hey, develop the skills to predictably hit quota and like figure out, you know, how we're going to measure some of that, right? The, the harder part, so Dan was easy as the executive because it was really his vision, right? The hard part was convincing the reps and even some of their leaders to buy in on this whole thing. Because um, to your point, you would think, oh, this is great. I'm going to love it. But that really took some doing because like reps and their sales managers, I mean, they're coin operated. So all they really care about is, hey, I just want to hit my quota number, right? I don't care anything about other than quota. And so we had to get them to see the value in, in this strategy for like, okay, well, in order to hit quota, you really need to be hitting these leading indicator target numbers right? Um, most of them didn't care about that because at the end of the day, they're not really seeing a connection, right? And it's like, okay, let me just focus on quota. I'm not going to worry about hitting these other numbers too. This is the only one that matters. That was a real challenge to try and overcome that. And so to do that, we needed some hard numbers in order to convince them of the value before we could really bring them along. You know, we needed a narrative to be able to back it up uh, with, with some hard data. Data is the, just everything. <laughs> And yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> it's the only way I was going to be able to move the needle on it, right? Yep. So then, how did you like measure your results? Like, how did you get this data? Like, what did you like? What was the process for that? So we started the whole thing off, um, you know, by working with Dan and a few members of his team, some of his direct reports, the sales leaders, uh, in order to figure out like what the metrics should be and to figure out what the target for each of them should be. So we looked at mountains of data to be able to come to that and ran a whole bunch of different scenarios. And eventually we landed on where those targets should rest. And then from there started setting some goals throughout 2019 to say, okay, well, how, where are we at today? How much are we going to increase the percentage of reps hitting those, those targets, right? And that the idea would be each quarter, ideally we see this steady increase of, of current reps, uh, a greater percentage of them hitting each of those targets. And then for any new or ramping reps that were coming on, that they're onboarding, they would also be put on that schedule, right? To show, okay, great, you're going to master this set of skills and hit these targets and then move on and master the next set, to hit these targets and so on. Uh, and, and so, you know, the idea would be that those skills would be reflected then in those numbers and that they were, and not just that they learned it, but they were actually applying it on the job. So sales leaders then, and I just want to call this out too, sales leaders were the ones that were responsible for driving quota attainment for their teams. Like that's their number to own. But sales enablement, we were the ones that were like being held accountable for the leading indicator metrics, these six skill metrics, right? And so that was really our next on the line there. Um, you know, with being able to drive some hard numbers like that, that should lead to quota attainment. So you've got, you've got executive buy-in, you know, sponsorship, uh, you know, kind of budget behind it. You're working towards your metrics. Like, was it easy to pull the data for, for, <laughs> for this? Because so many things to work through. And there's like, okay, so first of all, it's like, okay, the concept seems straightforward, uh, challenging, sure. But you know, Hey, clear. And then we start diving in and we're starting to pull the data and you've got conflicting data coming from different places and you're pulling these reports and you're trying to figure out like the cadence of pulling that. Um, and then there's a million different ways of slicing that data as well. You know, are you looking at the previous quarter numbers? Are you looking at the last 90 days? Are you looking at a quarter to date figure? Like what, what is it you're looking at? And then just trying to dig through and sort all of that out. Um, I mean, that alone revealed some interesting things that we were, we had to, you know, the organization wasn't ready to support yet, right? And we had to call those things forward just so we could trust the data we were getting and know we can count on the numbers. So there's a lot of that stuff, though, never would have like come to the surface if we didn't have this initiative that forced us to dig in on issues like that. So that, that was really revealing. But yeah, I, and I we're going off script just a little bit, but this is kind yeah. of interesting because I, I can't tell you the number of like messages that I get from enablement people. They're like, how are you like measuring this? Or I'm having trouble pulling the data. Like in all of the roles that I've been in, all the companies that I've been at, you know, 
data is one of those really hard things to nail down. You know, it, if you look at it in a certain way or if certain, you know, companies or, or business units are looking at it in a different way, if they're pulling it a different way, you know, you can get and create a very different story depending on the data that you're looking at it and how you're looking at it. Yeah. And at Qualtrics, it was interesting. I mean, one of the reasons I joined Qualtrics, I was so impressed that a company of that size, now keep in mind, this was before the SAP acquisition and, you know, where we were at at the time. Um, but I was so impressed, like a company of this size is so robust with their data and with their reporting systems. I was really impressed with that and really surprised by it. It was like an abundance, an embarrassment of riches when it came to how much data. What was lacking was the insight of, okay, what do you do with all of this? It's almost a, an overwhelming amount. So what insight do you get out of that? And that was a very different problem, right? Because a lot of other places I've been throughout my career, it's a lack of data and a lack of reporting systems and there isn't much flowing there. Here, it was almost like the problem was the opposite. You got so much, but what do you do with it? And what insights can it yield? And nothing actionable was really, you know, being done with it that way, so. Yeah, that's, that's super interesting. So you've got executive buy-in, you got the data, you got everything, like, it sounds like like a like a no brainer. It sounds like you achieved all the outcomes you wanted. Was this like a perfect execution? Did you achieve all the outcomes you wanted to, John? Yeah, don't I wish? No, no, not at all. Um, <laughs> that doesn't mean there wasn't good fruit, though, right? Like, I wish I could tell you that this was this perfectly, like, hey, we we set our you know we set our target, and then we designed our strategy, and we executed that perfectly, and then here was the result that we got against that. We hit that target. No, it didn't go like that at all. Um, but that doesn't mean there wasn't good fruit from it. it. It's just that there was a lot of good that came of it. We landed in a really good place. It just wasn't the place that we expected to land. And that was because of, but we couldn't have known that like until we jumped in and really started working the program as we had set it up. And it, it yielded some really interesting things. They just were kind of unpredictable things when we, when we went into it, right? So it so, wasn't well, like the A team, like I love it when a plan yeah, comes no, together. It didn't. It didn't yeah, happen it like that. Never a cigar, right? <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. No. No. So then, what surprised you? Like looking back on the initiative now, like kind of hindsight's always twenty twenty. But what right. surprised you about this entire kind of initiative and program? Well, the big curveball for us was, you know, we ran into that uh, roadblock I was describing earlier, where it was like, hey, we really can't get very many reps and leaders on board with this. We need a narrative. We need to establish the value, give them some hard numbers. And so we started digging in in search of that narrative and doing a lot of this data analysis work here. And what we found is that, you know, when we started analyzing the data to see, we wanted to see like how these data points and how these metrics um, correlated with quota attainment, you know, if at all. And we found some interesting stuff. Like of those original six metrics, two of them didn't have any correlation to quota attainment at all. None. Oh, wow. And then of the four that remained, we did see a very, a very strong uh, correlation to quota there, but not with any single metric by itself, but rather through this combination of these metrics. So like, for example, what we saw is that like if a rep hit zero of those four remaining targets, then they literally had a 0% chance of reaching their quota that quarter. And we ran this for a couple of quarters, so about six months window here. Uh, if they hit just one of those four metrics, their chances of hitting their quota was still very slim. It was just barely over 4%. But if they hit three or more out of those four metrics, then their chances skyrocketed to 95%, over 95% chance of making quota that quarter. So that became a really compelling narrative on the importance of investing in skill development and finding like the right metrics to gauge that. that. That gave us our narrative, right? The hard numbers that we had been looking for. And I mean, you know, some people might look at that and say, oh, okay, well, so you improve their skills and then more of them reach quota, like, duh. Right? But it, I mean, it's not a duh at all, right? I mean, to us in learning and enablement, that seems obvious, I guess. But I mean, even to, to those of us in this profession, I mean, most people still treat that like it's an article of faith or something, right? Not that there's actually like a proven model that's backed up with hard data to support it, right? We just kind of believe that. Sure, invest in the skills and quota will follow, right? But 
the analysis gave us that, right? Those hard numbers. And it wasn't just evidence that improving skills increases quota attainment, but more importantly, identified like which skills, which numbers should you be going after? And at what level of achievement do they need to reach? What target do they need to reach um, in order to actually get their result? That was the, the insightful part, really. And I would imagine, I mean, those are hard hitting like percentages and like numbers and like data. Like that's, you can't really argue with it. Like here are the metrics that we're measuring. If you don't do any of these, like, dude, you're not going anywhere. <laughs> like, that became a lot more compelling. All of a sudden we were having an easier time, you know, breaking down those barriers as a result of that. But, you know, and so the goal then became, okay, look, we're not even really going to focus on those two that didn't have any bearing. We're going to shift our strategy to focus on these four metrics. And then we're going to figure out like which skills or, or combinations of skills really drive those numbers and then shape our strategy around that. We were still going after like trying to increase the percentage of reps who were hitting those targets. Um, but now we could be a lot more focused about it because we knew, all right, well, great. We know where we should be targeting here. Yeah, it, it helps build a very cohesive and focused training program and kind of execution program. Once you've got all of that insight into it, it's no longer just kind of like shooting fish in a barrel. Like you're, you're not just kind of like guessing. It's, it's now very targeted and uh, like zeroed in kind of focused approach. Yeah, and, and, and you know, it brought a real focus to everything that we did because like our jobs are on the line with this, right? This this. This is the numbers we were held accountable to. And so you weren't distracted by a million other things. Like almost everything that you did was focused on this, right? Mm -hmm. But it put a lot of brain power behind it, a lot of talent from the team. But that was also the, you know, you ask about, did we achieve those results? Well, I mean, yes, we did increase the percentage of reps hitting those targets, but that really wasn't the biggest jump and the biggest impact that we saw, right? Um, because in the process of crafting these strategies, we were also asking ourselves like, okay, well, where could you get that biggest lift and really drive the biggest impact, right? And um, the team noticed, well, gee, average deal size is an area where there seems to be the greatest opportunity because it, it gave us a leverage, right? It gave us some leverage with being able to say, yeah, that, you know, we have a better chance of the company hitting quota, which is ultimately the goal. Um, if we're able to increase the average deal size significantly. And so, yes, we are trying to bring up the percentage of reps hitting all of those, but we're also kind of playing it like, okay, where can we make that biggest splash too to help demonstrate our value a little bit more there? And I, and that's really the, the jump that we saw. In fact, there was a member of my team, uh, her name was Jamie Parks, um, who really honed in on that metric in particular. And like all of her strategy as one of my sales trainers was really focused on that you know, to drive impact. And she really championed it. I mean, it was to the point where, the, you know, our average deal size for that group jumped up by 175%. Holy uh, cow. I mean, we exceeded our target number by almost by 4x. And so it was kind of like, wow, we really over-indexed on that. But in a way, it was great because it's like, well, it's hard to argue. Like, who's going to turn down that kind of increase, uh, you know, straight to the bottom line than you know, okay, we still did all right in the others, but wow, we really nailed that, you know, really, so. John, this, this one, you blew this one out of the water, man. I don't know. Like this <laughs> is, this is just not what we're looking for, bud. Like, <laughs> well, that, that's actually a really good example of what I mean when I say that, like, it's not the expected outcome. It wasn't the one we were going for. Right. And so we still ended up in a really good place because of that. It just wasn't the place we expected. And, you know, what do they say? Sometimes it's, you know, the crooked path ends up being the best one. I mean, I think that's a good example of that. I love that. So if you kind of like look back on everything, like what would you maybe have like tweaked or done differently, done sooner, not done at all? Like what would you maybe have, have kind of, you know, changed about the, the approach to this? I think the biggest thing I would change um, is the way in which we ended up using those leading indicator targets. I think we should have used them a bit differently than what we did. Probably not so much on the side of like holding people accountable to leading indicator targets, but rather use them truly as like indicators of possible, you know, areas to, for skill development. Like, 
you know, I mean, if someone's not hitting quota, I would rather, hey, okay, fine, let's crack open that nut and then use these leading indicator metrics to find out why or point us in the direction, give us some clues as to where we could drive their skill development. So I, I think that there is absolutely a place for them. I'm just not sure the accountability thing was, or at least the way we drove the accountability was uh, was really the right approach, you know, because if you're using leading indicator data for accountability, then I think sometimes you end up missing the real target, the thing you're actually interested in, in attaining, right? And, you, and inadvertently, you end up pursuing some of the wrong things. I mean, so I'm, I'm a big believer, obviously, in, in skill development, but, but, but it's really just a means to an end. It's not the end in and of itself, right? We're not just training them to train them, right? It's not the goal. It's the means to the goal. So, uh, but, you know, I mean, Figuring it out, like we couldn't have known that either, I think, until you, you dove in. And the result of diving into all of this, you know, not only did we get that result, but it also changed the way that we work as an enablement team. Because the, the process of going through all of that to try to devise strategies to increase skills that would lead to the, these results, I mean, that led us down the path of figuring out like a competency-based approach to our curriculum. And it changed the way we were addressing training and our curriculum. Uh, and now, I mean, that forms the basis of like everything my team does today. Um, and so another good example where it's like, okay, that probably wouldn't have come about on its own. Um, going through a program like this accelerated the need for it because we had to identify what, what are those skills, what are those competencies that would, are most likely to uh, result in those numbers. And so it put us on a really good path. Um, you know, today we're, we're in the process of transforming our enablement function into a data led organization. So that's great. You know that, but we wouldn't have gotten there if it wasn't for this. Yeah. I love that. This is like, it, it never ends up how you think it's going to end up, but yeah. you always get to a place when you look back on it, you're like, you know what, I'm actually kind of glad that it didn't go perfectly or that we didn't get all of the things or, or end in the place that we thought we were going to end. Because then, like you said, you've kind of like now you're able to kind of transform your entire approach to, to things. And now you've got so yeah. much that you've learned. Yeah, and now, I mean, what it sets us up for is kind of our next big leap. So we're currently in the process of taking a look at some of those numbers, but also pulling in other data points as well and looking at those in different combinations to kind of reveal, okay, what's like the next skill set areas that we're going to target and, and figure out where the next big loop is for us. I love that. This is great. So one of the things that's important to me about like any of the information that I kind of share, whatever, is providing some kind of like tangible, actionable like thing that like anybody who listens to this recording can kind of like take back next week or next month or whatever and be like, you know what, I'm going to give this a shot. What's like one actionable insight that you think that people could kind of take away from your experience or like this, the story to like try in their own practice? Uh, yeah, great question. And I love the actionable approach there. Um, so I, I would suggest um, give some serious thought as to how you would establish hard numbers to reach, but numbers that actually matter. So what I've seen is that throughout most of my time in learning and development and enablement functions, most of the metrics that most L&D teams or enablement teams focus on, most of their metrics really don't matter all that much, right? I mean, not to the business anyway right? We focus too much probably on, you know, training completion rates and satisfaction scores. You know, how much did you like the training you just went through? Or how did they score on a knowledge test or something? Stuff like that, right? And that's fine. I'm not saying don't use that, right? I'm just saying that too often we settle just for that stuff. But like, who cares? What, like, it doesn't mean anything if it doesn't translate to the result, right? So um, the other mistake I think that we make is that we tie to the wrong goal that does matter. So we pick a goal like quota attainment. Great, super impactful goal, absolutely matters. But if we tie to it, well, all your reps are tied to it, all your sales leaders are tied to it, you know, sales engineering's tied to it, pre-sales are tied to you it. Know, all, all these other groups are tied to it as well. So how do you really establish like the enablement functions contribution to that? So I would recommend identify the hard numbers but ones that you can actually be the, you know, leading out on and driving as an enablement function. Um, and then, you know, it's a lot easier to be able to establish enablement's contribution then. Um, find that hard number and then develop your strategy around it and align all of your efforts in support of that strategy. 
that would be my advice. That's huge. And I think that's, that's definitely something that enablement folks kind of in general struggle with is like, well, did enablement have an impact on quota attainment? Or was it because we had a spiff that, you know, came in halfway through the quarter or, you know, was it a president's club was announced and it's some like fantastic, you know, vacation or something like we can try and kind of, you know, tire our, our, you know, wagon to that goal, but it can be really, really hard to, to really quantify whether or not enablement, you know, did take a part in influencing that. So I think that's a, that's a great um, suggestion and like actionable insight for people to do. So John, thank you so much for joining me on like this very first episode of this show. I'm this is great. You bet. You bet. <laughs> and if people have questions, can they like find you on LinkedIn? Are you like absolutely. not accepting new followers? Like <laughs> absolutely, always accepting new followers. Uh, please feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. Uh, be happy to connect with anybody. And and thank you, Steph, for sending yeah. us. Really enjoyed it today. Awesome. Thanks so much, John. And thanks so much to the, the viewers that were watching. Um, if you or someone that you know is in enablement and you want to be highlighted on the show and a program that you did to kind of share those insights with other people, um, put it in the thread in wherever, whatever platform you're watching in or send me a direct message on LinkedIn. And until then, keep building, everybody. See ya.